Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy, where are you going? sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. Mommy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you'd speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Uh... Good morning, Grace Bible Church. Grace and peace to you, Jesus Christ. Um, got a couple announcements for you this morning. Um, first of all, there's two Zoom opportunities for this week. Um, one thing to note, there isn't an impact Zoom. Um, however, we still have the prayer meeting Zoom, as well as every Sunday, Bruce Morgan has his Sunday school class, so you can also catch that. Um, for donations, you can donate on the website, as well as um, here on the actual campus. Um, you can drop it off at the church. And finally, um, Awana Kids, you can turn in your verses on the Awana Grace Bible Facebook page. Um, and so that's an awesome opportunity for you. And now we have our call to worship from Ephesians 2, 17 through 20. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access to one spirit and to the Father. Now therefore... You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on one foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, as we pray, we'll start out with a time of silent prayer as we go to the Lord together, and then I'll close this. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us into your family and promising uh, great and precious things to us. This morning, we are uh, emboldened to ask you for the fulfillment of uh, those promises in that you would be among us, even uh, as we meet online and in different ways. Father, that you would take the gifts of the body and build us up into the image of Christ. And Father, we trust you, Lord, to speak to us. We thank you that you've spoken in various ways and at various times uh, to the fathers by the prophets. And in these last days, you've spoken to us by your Son, who is the brightness of your glory and the express image of your person, who upholds all things by the word of his power and who has made all things, who when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Father, we praise you and thank you for keeping us in the land of the living and for uh, ways that you've helped us physically and financially and been merciful to us 
and our families, uh, Father, in the provision of a, of a state and a country <clears throat> and a community that is such a blessing to us, the beauty of uh, the color green, the things around us and delights of, of the ear and the eye uh, that you lavish on us. You left not yourself without witness and that you gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. And Father, we praise you for those good gifts. Thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. We confess our sins to you, Lord. And Father, uh, we're aware of, of some and others we don't even know. Uh, but we thank you, Lord, that having been justified by faith, we have peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now uh, we think of those words of our Lord Jesus in praying for his disciples who prayed, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. Father, I pray that they may be one just as we are, I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, now we worship and we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now we know in part then we shall know just as also we are known. And so, Lord, draw near to us as we draw near to you. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, folks. Let's join our voices together and lift high the name of the Lord this morning. Sing praises rising. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning.
And I cannot stand out, fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. This is our time for our pastoral prayer. Stephen Janice Quakenbush are our missionaries of the week that we'll be focusing on and spending some time in prayer. Don't forget, uh, we have a book filled with all of the our missionaries that we support uh, that with their contact info. And we would encourage you to be um, thoughtful about uh, sending a note of encouragement to them and to spend some time praying for them as well. Uh, and thank you for those who are doing that. And uh, so let's pray together for our church family and for the Quaken Bushes now. Father God, we give you praise and glory and we thank you so much for all that you do and are doing. Thank you for your sovereignty and your power in the midst of this uh, virus. And uh, we pray that we continued peace for those who are feeling discouraged. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who need financial help and for those who need jobs uh, or to get uh, their job back. We pray uh, for those uh, who are seeking employment and for those who are needing housing, uh, who are having a difficult time in these areas. And we pray for their encouragement. We pray that even, they, even though they are in this valley, that they would seek you and know that you are with them uh, and that your presence would give them peace. Uh, we pray uh, for the Quaken Bushes and their ministry. And we thank you for their, so, their years of service. And when we pray for their encouragement as they continue to equip others uh, and spread the gospel. So we pray for those who are with us online and those who are with us in the parking lot, uh, that your word would go out and be an encouragement to those who hear them. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ confronted Simon Peter on the seashore after the resurrection with the three times repeated question, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And each time uh, Peter responds in a slightly different way and Jesus responds with, feed my sheep, uh, feed my lambs. And the third time Simon Peter is grieved because Jesus said to him, do you love me? And his answer is something that I think the Apostle John remembered in later years because as Peter is hearing this instruction to feed Christ's sheep, to love uh, the Christians that are put uh, under his authority and under his ministry, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And in our passage in 1 John this morning, there is this thought that we are often unaware of what our hearts really contain or what they're really made of or where exactly we stand. And so John, in these brief six verses, says two times, by this we know. And we love this verse from 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And so throughout this letter, we're seeing over and over again how John says, by this we know, in this we know, by this we know. And we're very near the pinnacle of that in this passage uh, this morning. When I first came to Bryan College in 1985, I uh, was told that there were beautiful places to hike and, and scenic places to visit and a good place to camp called Laurel Falls. 
And so uh, some guys, I guess at lunchtime, convinced me that we should go camping this weekend at Laurel Falls, and they didn't seem to be in a hurry, and so neither was I. And so there was a guy down living in BV17, Bryan Village Unit Number 17, named Blair Herm, who could guide us real well to this good camp spot on Laurel Falls. And so we drove down to BV17, and I remember that nobody seemed to be in a hurry, and they were cooking a, a din- uh, uh, some kind of meal in the oven, and uh, Scott Frankio and Jeff Pipe and other residents of BV17 were coming in and out, and so finally Blair came, and we followed him out to Pocket Wilderness, and uh, probably started our hike close to 5.30 or so. It was getting uh, a little bit dark in the sky already. And it wasn't long till I was walking behind uh, the other two guys, John Kelly and Ted Rayleigh, in total darkness and could see very little except the back of the person in front of me. I'm sure we were short on flashlights. And I did not know where we were, did not know where we were going, uh, did not know what my situation was uh, at all. I just knew that we were generally going up and up and up and there was some climbing and there was some rocks. And so we finally get to this stopping place. I can't see much. And so we bed down on this rocky surface that I can kind of feel is pretty high, but I don't really know where we are. And then lo and behold, the next morning, the sun comes up And uh, we're up there looking down on creation with this incredible view of where we've come from and where we are on top of Laurel Falls. Well, the Apostle John is aware that as we march forward, sometimes trudge along in the Christian life, we can suffer from the same ignorance. And sometimes it's missing out on the beauty of where we are. Sometimes it's a place of danger if we don't know where we've come from or what we are. And this morning, John wants us to not be in any doubt, but to know so. Back when I was growing up, going to Bible memory camp, we sang this little chorus. Some think so, they hope so, they trust so, they guess so, but I know, I know I am saved. Well, I think the Apostle John is very much in sympathy with that mentality that we can know, we can know so. We don't have to guess or wonder or hope or uh, merely have optimism about where we stand. He wants us to know where we stand, and he says twice, by this we know. Michael Palmer will read our passage this morning, 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. Michael? This then is how we know that we belong to the truth, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And so the Apostle John wants us to know where we stand. And he's got these four ideas. We know where we stand because love shows us a great deal about where we stand. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week about having the family likeness show up in our lives for real and in ways that are in deed and in truth. We know where we stand partially as a reliance on what God knows, that God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. We know where we stand in part because of how prayer goes. Love shows, God knows, and when we know where we stand, there is a freedom and a boldness and a confidence in prayer that goes forward. And lastly, we know where we stand because the Spirit flows. There is a witness that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8 where his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. And so there is this uh, fourfold ability 
to know where we stand. And if I can just remind you of how our passage last week ends, in 1 John 3, 18, we had this statement from John. He says, Beloved, let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In truth. And that word truth sparks something in John's mind. And so he keeps on going in verse 19 and says, By this we know that we are of the truth. In other words, when you love in truth, that is a clue that you have been born of the truth. Now, remember that John has heard Jesus say to Nicodemus, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He said in his prologue, the Apostle John said in John 1, 12, and 13, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name, who were, what? Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are seeing that a birth has taken place, a new birth, what we call in theology regeneration, a new genesis, a new creation. And John has been at pains to show us the family likeness that we are to display. And he's mentioned that this family likeness especially shows up in how we love our brothers. If one of you sees his brother having need, having, if one of you has this world's goods and sees his brother having need and shuts up his heart of compassion from him, verse 17, How does the love of God dwell in him? Beloved, let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. By this we know that we are of the truth, that we are real. Love shows. You hear a telltale accent. You know, you can kind of tell when someone is from Memphis as opposed to someone who's from Roanoke. Their accent shows where they're from. And John says love reveals where we are from. There is this identity that comes out in the way that we love others. Now, John is going to use the word abide several times in this passage, and it's evident that he's thinking again uh, about Jesus' words in John 15. He says, by this we know, here in 1 John 3, 19, that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. In many ways, this is a passage about assurance. You know, it's a very dangerous thing to think you're real when you're not. And we know some of the plot of the Pixar movie Toy Story where uh, Woody is trying to tell Buzz that he's not a real space ranger. He's just a toy and that he's not the real thing. And they come to realize as toys that their value is bound up and whose name is written on them and that there's a sense in which they are real because of who loves them. The same moral is taught in Marjorie Williams' children's story, The Velveteen Rabbit. And the skin horse talks to the velveteen rabbit about what it takes to be real and that it doesn't often happen uh, to toys that are fragile because most of the time by your real, you've had the fur, lo- fur loved off you. It's, it's painful. It takes time. And it doesn't happen all at once. But once it happens, it lasts forever, the skin horse tells the Velveteen Rabbit. It's a beautiful story about how that takes place. Well, John is very concerned that our love is genuine, that it's of truth. But he's going on to say, by the way, if you begin to see love in your life towards your brothers and sisters, by this we know that we're real, that we are of the truth and we can assure our hearts before him. Now, notice that phrase, before him. I glossed over that in my reading of this passage over and over again until I came to see that this assurance that we enjoy is an assurance that is in God's presence. It's an assurance that the most important part of it is it equips us to have an intimacy with God. In the passage that Benjamin read as our call to worship, We heard about how that we who once were far off have been brought near, that he preached peace to those who were far off and to those who were near, and that by him we have access through one spirit to the Father. We've got our entree. We've got our entrance. 
And so the best part of assurance is not my happy feelings about knowing that I'm saved. In my opinion, the best part of assurance is the intimacy that it creates. John says, when you have real love in your life, by this we know that we are of the truth and we assure our hearts. Martin Lloyd-Jones points out in his book, Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cure, that we have to preach the gospel to ourselves. And there's this inward conversation. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word for meditate that we read about in uh, Deuteron- or J- Joshua chapter 1 and Psalm 1 has this idea of the inward conversation, the muttering, the conversation that we have with ourselves all day long. Long And Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about that psalm where he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Well, John is a good psychologist. And uh, remember that all truth is God's truth. Sometimes people rely on psychology like a religion and a kind of psychologism creeps in where it becomes a replacement and just becoming the best me I can be becomes people's religion. But good psychology includes this notion that we need to talk to our own hearts, that we need to assure our own hearts, and that's the psychology this passage reveals. That when we have genuine love in our lives, when we love people with a love that Ephesians 4.1 is worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Not that we have that of ourselves, but when there is a spirit-born love in our lives, it gives us an ability to assure our own hearts. We shall assure, persuade, the word could be translated, persuade our own hearts before him. Persuade our hearts before him. Persuade our hearts what? That we're real that we have come from God and are going to God, that we are of the truth. Love shows we can know where we stand because love shows. But secondly, we can know where we stand because God knows. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul reflects on the same interior conversation that we have where we begin to see fruit in our lives. And and I know that some of us have a sensitive conscience and we would be very slow to point to anything in our own lives and say, look, there's the work of God. But it is possible. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 this, moreover, It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But listen to this in verses three and four. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Verse four. For I know of nothing against myself. Listen to that clear conscience. I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Verse five. Uh, This was one of Dr. Cornelius' favorite verses. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. John is wise enough to know that we're not justified by taking a look at our fruit, taking a look at our love and saying, Yeah, as a matter of fact, I am all that. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm a pretty big deal. I have what it takes. No, that's not what justifies us. John says in verse 20, if our heart condemns us, and the language pretty much indicates that this is a normal thing, that our hearts will come after us. Our conscience will come after us. Now, don't have time this morning to go into a whole sermon on the biblical doctrine of the conscience, but basically the word conscience is an interior knowledge of what's right and wrong, and everybody's got one. Everybody has the law of God written on the hearts, whether that person is saved or not, and to ignore one's conscience is a foolish, wicked thing to do. In 1 Timothy 1, Paul talks to Timothy and says, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. And so it's a a very serious thing when your conscience comes after you. And John says in verse 20, if 
our heart condemns us, and I take that as a synonym for the conscience, our heart comes after us and says, you're guilty. You're guilty. Something is not right. David's heart smacked him. It smote him in the King James language when he cut off the corner of Saul's robe. There was something wrong about that that he knew was wrong, and his conscience uh, w- was activated, was, was responding like a nerve ending. Well, in the Christian life, it often happens that your conscience, like a judge, pronounces a guilty verdict on you. And John wisely says this, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Now, uh, this is a little test you can do on yourself. Is that a comforting thought to you that God knows all things or is that a disquieting thought? Uh, the commentators, uh, among whom uh, Lenski uh, mentioned, the Lutheran commentator Lenski is one, says that this probably cuts both ways. The fact that God knows all things means, by the way, you know those guilty items that your conscience brings up to you? Hey, by the way, you didn't love your spouse quite as well. You spoke to your daughter unkindly. Uh, by the way, you should have planted a gospel seed with that man at the grocery store. Oh, by the way, uh, that wasn't quite honest what you said. Well, you know what? God knows a whole lot more than that. And John remembers how over and over again, Jesus knows their hearts. John 2 Many believed in him, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew the hearts of all men and did not need anyone to testify to him of what was in the heart of man. God knows all things. John remembers Peter's statement, Lord, you know all things. God knows our hearts, and that may disquiet us a little bit, that um, our sense of where we stand with God uh, doesn't just depend on the evidence that we can see. Now, thankfully, John has already shown us what to do when we have a guilty conscience. He's already shown us that when we walk in the light, that is who Jesus is, things are going to be shown up that need to be confessed. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, If we say that we we walk in the light, but we uh, don't practice the truth, Uh, something needs to be corrected. But if we confess our sins, he's told us, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And isn't it interesting that in 1 John 2, 1, when we're aware of our sins, he doesn't tell us, hey, go and get your resume shined up a bit. Go and and practice some, some good work so that you know that everything's okay. He says, if anyone sins, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the righteous one. And it's in his righteousness that we hide. But John is saying something a little bit subtle. He's saying, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. And he knows things our hearts don't know. It is possible that the guilty verdict your heart brings to you is also an illegitimate verdict. It's, there may be things where we know that we're doing our best to live with our sin confessed, and yet we still feel guilty, but God's greater than our hearts, and God and his son Jesus Christ have justified us. I'm very convinced by the whole letter that the statement God knows all things is not meant to give us a big brother sense of Uh, of, you know, you better uh, not pout, you better not cry uh, because God's keeping a list. You better watch it because you're guiltier than you know. I think ultimately that God knows all things points back to our justification by faith. Now, how do I know that? Well, let me just uh, mention a couple quotes here from an excellent sermon by Spurgeon. Talking about those who were under this false verdict of guilt, Spurgeon says this, they forget that the tribunal of conscience, though a very important one, is not the Supreme Court. And although it is well to try matters before the heart to see whether it condemns or acquits, yet there is another court far higher than the court of the human heart. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. The Christian comes into court and says, I admit my guilt. 
but I plead that Christ suffered in my place. I confess my sin, but I also claim, and this is so important, that it was laid upon Christ, and though my heart condemns me, God's greater than my heart, and he does not condemn me, for he looks from his dear son and sees me in him, except that in the beloved. Those who never study other people in the household but are selfish and let their own marrow be confined within their own ribs have nothing about them in common with a real Christian. If a man truthfully says, I love others and especially love the saints of God, then he may say that his conscience does not condemn him. Now, I want to just say that we know there is therefore now what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, Romans 8, 3. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and don't miss this phrase, he condemned sin in death. The flesh. Now, think forward to Romans 8, uh, verses 34 and following. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Did you hear that? The reason that we can respond to our conscience that condemns us with that God knows something our conscience may not know is that Christ stood condemned in my place. Who's going to condemn me when Christ has been condemned for me and my sin has been condemned in the body of Christ? It's been judged, and that punishment has been carried out. Now, um, John is going to go on and say here in 1 John chapter 3 that there is the possibility that um, our conscience does not condemn us, that our heart does not condemn us. Look at verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. We have boldness. We have assurance. And so John is going to say here that we can know where we stand because love shows some indicators about the reality of God's work in our lives. We can know where we stand because God knows things our heart does not know. And when our conscience condemns us, we need to take anything that conscience reveals and confess those things. But we may also need to say that God knows more than our conscience, more than our heart knows. Um, The Christian who comes into this court and can say, yeah, there is some love for others in my life is in a different state. He's in a place where there's a little more boldness and confidence. Spurgeon goes on to say in that same sermon, he says, if a man truthfully says, I'm skipping the middle of this quote, I love others and I especially love the saints of God, then he may say that his conscience does not condemn him. Now listen to this line here. He says, the man who has a clear conscience like a little bird to sing in his heart has confidence toward God in this way. He knows that he is the Lord's and that God loves him. He knows that God is his father and his friend and he therefore goes to God in great confidence about his troubles and tells them all to him. He has much confidence in prayer and he may talk to God in prayer in a way which other people may think too familiar, yet it will not be so. His heart is right with God and therefore he has confidence toward God. Now, I know this is some pretty deep water to swim in, but understand that John is talking about that situation where in our relationship with God, we wonder where we stand. We can know from what love shows us, but beyond that, God knows things that our hearts don't know. And we should labor to maintain a clear conscience so that we can have confidence in our relationship with God. A clear conscience is a powerful thing. And this uh, segues into John's next point, that we can know where we stand in part because of the way prayer goes forward in our lives. Love shows 
God knows and prayer goes. Now, sometimes we rip this verse kicking and screaming out of its context, but look with me at verse 22. Don't forget this word and. It's a joined thought. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that he that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, isn't it interesting that the commandment there is singular, as though believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and loving the brothers and sisters is really one thing. Remember what Galatians 5 says? So in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but what? Faith working through love. And so he boils down, he distills the Christian life and what really pleases God into one command, and that is that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what uh, Jesus says to people who came to him in the chapter where he uh, feeds the the, the multitude, and then they said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus says what? This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent so in other words john is saying that when we know where we stand with god that we know he's our father that we're seeing what love shows in our lives this family likeness that we know that god knows things we don't know and he is able to justify our hearts even if our hearts condemn us because christ was condemned in my place and he's faithful and just to forgive those sins i confess and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness then prayer goes forward in a powerful way. Now, it's very clear here that John is remembering back to Jesus' ministry. He's remembering back to the upper room and that long passage on abiding in Christ, living in Christ, remaining, staying there, finding our home in Christ, and that uh, discipline that Harriet Beecher Stowe had so much to say about a few sermons ago. And I'd like us to turn back there because he's going to say a couple of things that I believe uh, this verse comments on. If you look at John 15 where Jesus says, if, in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, and he links that to prayer. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, what? You shall ask what you will and it shall be done for you. Do you see that connection? That when we are knowing where we stand, that we who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, that because God is my Father, by his grace, that family image is starting to poke up through the soil just a little bit. Even a telltale sign encourages me that I have a changed heart. Then there's something about my prayer life that changes. Isn't it interesting how bold God's promises in the Bible about prayer are and that We can delight ourselves in the Lord, also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. John 14, 13, uh, that we can ask anything in his name and Jesus says, I will do it. Um, How do we square that with our experience that, um, frankly, some of my prayers have gotten what appears to be the answer of no. Uh, Some of my prayers, I feel like God has kept me waiting for that answer for a long time well i think what john is envisioning here is that we get closer to the lord so that our prayer lives more and more reflect what he wants for us and that as we pray we can be assured that his answer will be yes or i have something better now i don't want to mince words or deny the fact that in a fallen world, this takes faith to believe. This takes faith to trust that when something that I had prayed over falls flat, when I experience the death of a loved one, and and let's just be honest, there are people, families in our church mourning uh, that loss right now, mourning a loved one who's had a disease for a long time that God has not healed. It takes faith to say, yes, Lord, I believe that what I ask in Jesus' name, you'll give. uh, And leave that with the Lord into how he will answer that, with that answer of yes, 
and that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Psalm 84, 11, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Romans 8, 32, he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, John is telling us that as we know where we stand because love shows, because God knows that prayer goes forward in a childlike way of asking and receiving. He says, and whatever we ask from him, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment which he has given us that we should believe on the name of his son and we should love our brothers. He's saying that as we know where we stand, as we find ourselves on top of creation, looking down on a view that makes us say, behold, what kind of love God's lavished on me that, that I should be called a child of God. Knowing who I am, he's calling me his son and even starting to make his family likeness appear in me. Wow, I'm emboldened to ask. And he's gonna say this again in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Look over at those verses where he says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, and he has this qualifier, according to his will, he hears us. Now, I don't know what you're learning during COVID-19. Um, you may be uh, learning new video game skills that you never had before uh, and learning new levels of, of uh, how to be uh, a hermit, uh, among other things. But, um, you know, in, in our house, we just got a duckling, and so we've uh, named him Clive O'Loren. Let's see. Clive O'Loren Veritas Ichabod Duckworth, which spells COVID. So we've got Clive the duck, and we're learning about duck care. I hope that in your household, you're learning some spiritual things that you didn't know before. And I'll just can be candid and say, I'm trying to learn how to pray better. John tells us that there's an element of our prayer life that is maximized when we know where we stand as children of God. There's a boldness that comes along that as I draw closer to the Lord, I'll ask things according to his will and I'll receive those things from him. I think it's a basic equation from the Bible that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But on the flip side, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And in James 5, it goes on to say, Elijah was a man of like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And so... God's word teaches us to grow in our ability to pray. When we know where we stand, love shows, God knows, and prayer goes. And lastly, John says, the spirit flows. Look there at 1 John 3 and those last verses, verse, uh, the last verse, verse 24, where he says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Love shows. God knows. Prayer goes and the Spirit flows. Now, um, isn't it interesting that John is once again quoting Jesus' statement, abide in me and I in you. And he may have John 15, 16 in mind where Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, and here's prayer again, that whatever you ask the Father, he may give you. Now, the reason that we learn to call God Father is because he has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. There is something in the heart of a believer that makes it reflexive, to turn to God as a father, and that something is the Holy Spirit. John has called it the anointing. But here I believe he may even be reminding his listeners, his readers in Ephesus, uh, that this is where the Spirit comes in. He teaches us to call God Father. If I could mention this uh, quote from John's, John Calvin's commentary on this passage. He seals his free adoption on our hearts by his own Spirit. In other words, Romans 8, 15, 
You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, a spirit of sonship by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are what? That we are children of God. He seals that on our hearts. And this is the language of experience, of feelings, of emotion, of psychology, of Holy Spirit psychology. He seals his free adoption on our hearts by his own spirit as we receive by faith the sure pledge of it offered in Christ. Now, Calvin's looking back at what love shows us. The love that we see in our lives is an accessory, a prop to our faith. Now, I want to mention something about um, the verb tenses, and you'll forgive me for Uh, waxing grammatical on you here again but if you'll look back at verse 23 he says this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ that verb tense is aorist which means it's a snapshot it's something that happened it's uh, viewed as an accomplished fact it's not in progress in the past it's not something that we hope will complete in the future it happened We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting. He changes his verb when he says, and love one another. That verb is present tense, which means it's an ongoing activity. And I really believe that in this matter of assurance of salvation, and and let me just say, um, ask, do you have assurance that you're saved? Um, Maybe you don't care. If your heart is grown dull and thick, and insensitive to caring whether or not you belong to Christ, you are in great danger. You're in danger of missing the purpose for which you were made. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you have, there is an assurance that rests in this quote on the pledge of what's been offered in Christ. You can have assurance because If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, 9, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God has promised that in Christ. But love in our lives is an accessory, a prop to our faith, a piece of evidence, if you will. And this passage ends with this beautiful thought. He who keeps his commandments abides in him. In other words, We can know that we're saved because God keeps his promises. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. hand. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, John 6, 37, I will by no means cast out. But he he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And he in him. There is this mutual indwelling. And by this we know that he abides in us. By the spirit whom he has given us. What does that spirit do? That spirit produces in us the fruit of the spirit. Which is first of all what? The fruit of love. Do you see that fruit in your life? You can know where you stand because love shows. But beyond what love shows, the spirit inside teaches us what God knows, that he is our father because of his gracious work in Christ. And our assurance rests with love as a prop on the promise of God through faith in Jesus Christ and the gospel. And when we come near to God, prayer goes forward and the Spirit blows in our lives this instinct to say, Abba, Father. And we find ourselves up on top of the mountain looking down with the only explanation we can find, if I can quote that old song, uh, that that love has come to live in our hearts and we know we're of the truth and we assure our hearts before him. I want to invite you, wherever you are hearing this recording, watching this video, to ask yourself if you know where you stand. Do you know that God is your Father? Do you have that power in your life given to those who receive Jesus by believing on Him? If you don't, today I invite you to tell Him and to believe on Him, to put your faith in Him, that you are trusting 
Jesus Christ to be your Savior, that you're believing he died for your sins and rose again, and to ask him uh, into your life in this life-giving way that shows that God knows, that will help prayer flow, and which will lead the Spirit, will cause the Spirit to blow in your life. Let's pray together. Father, take these words uh, from the pen of John, breathed out by your Spirit, and use them for our good. Father, I pray that anyone outside of Christ today would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, and that we would know where we stand uh, by these means, by this we know. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We wanted to let you know a few things about the next f- stages of uh, us getting back together. And we're thinking as elders to do it as a phase uh, reopening sort of. And so what that looks like is the first phase is drive-in church. And uh, this was the first Sunday, May 10th, to be able to do that. And uh, we're going to be monitoring things. And then our next phase uh, will be Uh, probably two services on a Sunday morning in the auditorium where we limit the amount of people that gather at the same time and continue watching and making sure we're doing the social distancing. And then our third phase will be that we can gather all together in the auditorium for a Sunday morning worship service. And then our fourth phase will be that we can resume all normal activity and children's uh, ministries as well. 
And so we'll keep you up to date as far as how, what that looks like and when to expect that to happen. Uh, but at this point, we're only going to be doing our first phase, which is the drive-in church. And we're going to continue to have uh, our services online as well uh, during that time. And one other thing, I uh, wanted to make mention that we are going to go ahead and have a vote for the upcoming officers for all our boards. That's elders, deacons, deaconesses, and trustees. And uh, that will be coming out uh, via email or uh, you can let us know via paper copy if email is not very convenient for you. Uh, so th expect that uh, this next week uh, to be uh, notified of that and who is being elected for what office. If you were able to watch the service today, uh, scroll up to the top of this page and fill out the Grace Connection card that we have. It's a little link uh, that you can follow and let us know that you were there and who was there watching with you. And we would love to know that. Especially let us know if you have any prayer requests as well. Uh, and we will send that out. And on the prayer request mention, whether you can, whether it's confidential uh, or whether you'd like it posted on the prayer sheet that the uh, Wednesday night Zoom prayer meeting will be praying for. And now I'm going to close with a benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Let's pray together. Father God, we give you glory and we give you thanks for your, your love for us and for your perfect will. And we pray for your comfort and peace. And we pray, Lord, that our hearts um, would uh, speak truth uh, as we long for you and uh, long for a clear conscience. Uh, we pray that we would uh, genuinely, fully trust your uh, uh, sacrifice and your goodness and what you have done in order to make us right with God. Thank you so much for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.